So uh, I have the honor to uh, introduce Pablo, uh, who, uh, again, uh, another member of our Python infrastructure team. I remember Pablo joining as a pre-FSD many years ago now. This is very scary. So uh, uh, with great pleasure, here's Pablo talking about the soul of the beast. Awesome, so thank you very much for coming. So in, in this talk, um, I would like to um, go deep into an um, interesting question, which is uh, what makes Python Python, right? So we have two main parts that people recognize usually as Python. One is the interpreter, which is normally when you type Python, uh, you probably see Python, the one that will appear, which is the default implementation. But the interpreter can be done in many languages. As well, we have other, other implementations, for example, in Java, like Python or Iron Python. So that part can actually, so C Python is not technically what, what makes Python Python. So there is another part where people usually recognized as Python, which is the grammar, right? It's the, the kind of programs you, you write and, and the expressions you do. So in this particular talk, we are going to center on, on all the world surrounding that particular aspect of the language and how tiny technical details of how it's made up will impact a lot um, the code you write. So I will start with an interesting question. So the question is, is this valid Python code? Only like 10 seconds. Who thinks is valid Python code? Like, raise the hand. Who thinks is invalid? Well, this doesn't add up, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so actually this is valid Python code and this is the AST of this thing. Um, so you don't need to understand, it's just that this means that Python is able to parse this code. So it's some, some clever stuff, like this is actually like minus and bigger than, and this is the ellipsis thing, so, but it resembles some, something horrible, right? And the idea is that what, with this, what I want to say is that the code that people normally recognize as Python is actually a tiny subset of what the language actually allows. And there is some very twisted ways of, of um, writing valid Python programs, right? And in this talk, we're going to try to understand how these rules are actually laid out and what impact they have. Okay. So, um, so let's start with some grammar basics, right? Because we are talking about the grammar. So um, the grammar is basically a document that explains what is valid Python, right? So let's start with how this document is described. So we are going to have rules, right? And the rules are basically described as uh, a name for the rule, which is also a production, and then some description of, of what the rule is. So you have to bear in mind that what the grammar describes is actually how to generate Python programs. So the parser actually what it's going to do is that it's going to grab that grammar and it's going to sort of reverse engineer solving the opposite question, which is given a particular text, is this a Python program that can be generated out of the grammar? But you have to bear in mind that the grammar is laid out in a way it actually makes very easy to say, okay, give me a random Python program. So in that way, we'll have rules here and then rule descriptions on the second side. So um, we can have many um, descriptions for the same rule. So this basically means that this rule can actually produce these two things. Instead, usually instead of doing it in this way, we use the or operator. So this means that this rule can be this chunk or this other chunk. Uh, we will also have the plus sign. So the plus sign means one or more. This means that this rule is one letter A or more than one. It's very similar to regular expressions, but it, the, the, it's actually much more powerful than them, but you can familiarize more or less how to describe this thing if you have in mind regular expressions. So in the same way, we have the asterisk, which means zero or more. Um, then we will have these square brackets, which means this is optional. So we will have something like, this rule means that you can have an A or this particular other rule, and this particular other rule can be optional in, in that particular example. And then, so this is the actual, uh, so now that we have more or less that in mind, this is the actual gram a chunk of the actual grammar of, of Python, right? So let's, let's see how we interpret this thing. So we start in the first rule, which is file input, and then we say that Basically a file, what you can write in a file is start with a new line and then uh, like zero or more statements and then the end of the file. So you say, okay, what is a statement? So then you go here and you say, okay, a statement is a simple statement or a compound statement. And then you say, okay, what is a simple statement? I said, okay, it's a small statement or et cetera, et cetera, right? And then in the component statement, we see things that we more or less recognize already, right? Like if statement, while statement. So all of these are po po things that are possible. And the idea is that the whole document, which this is only a subset, will basically describe what is possible um, in, in the grammar. And then we have to distinguish two possible inputs here. So one is, um, 
So let's go here. Ah, yeah. So one of these is what we call a terminal. So a terminal here is a word which is surrounded by quotes. This means like literally this word. So for example, for the while statement, we expect the word while. And then we have this non-terminal. So if you imagine this grammar as a tree, the terminals are the leaves and the non-terminal are any intermediate node, right? So a non-terminal basically is something that you need to expand. It basically refers to another rule. So one thing which is not super important here, but one thing is that if, um, if the, basically the grammar is written in a way that is sort of substitution, so basically you have here a rule and then you have always the description of the rule at the end, it's called a context-free grammar. There is other definition for that, but the idea is that uh, that simplifies a lot of things. And um, the idea is that uh, we have to be, we will see later how this thing play, but it's very important uh, to distinguish these two terms because the words that you can write at the beginning of the rule or the words that can start the rule will impact a lot how, how certain structures are allowed in CPython. So I skip this, this slide. So this is another part of, of uh, the grammar. So we'll see the, the statements that we mentioned before, right? So we saw that component statement can be any of these, and then we start seeing. So for example, an if statement is the word if, followed by something that evaluates to a condition or an object you made that can be true or false, then the, um, the column. And then this suite is basically a block, what people recognize usually as a block, is called here in the grammar suite. And then you have the leaf and all the stuff. So the idea is that we have this document, right, with these kind of rules, which basically describe what is, um, what is possible to write and what is not. So let's analyze the impact that it has or the particular um, things that CPython imposes over this. So um, particularly the CPython grammar is an LL1 grammar. So let's see what it is. Um, so an L1 grammar is a grammar that is parsed left to right. You do leftmost derivation, which means that you analyze first the token which is on the, on the left and then you start expanding from that. And this is the most important rule, which is that when you are parsing, like the parser when he's analyzing a particular program and he's comparing it with the grammar, can only look one token on the, on the, the like one token ahead, which means that if I need to distinguish a rule, like imagine you have a particular rule which has two possibilities, like two productions, and then I need to distinguish which one of the two is the correct one. So for doing that, I can only look the next token in the input, right? So for example, if you are doing something like for x in range something, and I find the word for, if I need to distinguish two different productions, I can only look one token ahead, which will be this x in the example that I put. So it turns out that this is a very well-known problem, how to solve, like this actually leads to very simple parsers. Um, but the Python grammar has two more particularities that made the parser even simpler. For the ones that know more a bit of grammar theory, basically this is um, a parser generated with a parse table uh, with the, what is known as the first sets and the follow sets, more on this later. But particularly we have two more things here. One is that the Python grammar doesn't allow empty productions. This means that every rule has to be something that doesn't end in the empty string. So an empty production is basically a rule that can be empty. And this makes the parser more difficult because if you have rules that can be empty and you can only look one token ahead, then if the rule is empty, you need to actually look two. So that's what leads to what is called the follow sets. So we, because we don't need them, I'm not going to explain in this talk. And then we have another kind of rule which is a bit more loosey. Um, this is not actually enforced, but it's basically the grammar is laid out in that way, which means that in some levels, only the last alternative of the rule can have a non-terminal. Um, so for example, um, we can see, whoops. Okay, so for example, let's see this one. So uh, if you see this, um, so the flow statement, so we have break, continue, return, raise, and yield. So you check all of them except yield, they start with a non-terminal, right? So for example, break statement start with break, continue statement start with continue, et cetera, et cetera. But the only one who actually starts with a non-terminal is yield statement, which is here a non-terminal called yield expression. So this is more or less laid out and this simplifies a bit more um, how the first sets are laid out and, and it, it makes it easier to produce the parser. So, um, Okay, so this is more or less the grammar. So let's, let's uh, describe what is this first set. So the first sets for a rule, for example, let's pick simple statement, are all the non-terminals the rule can start with. And this is very important because as we saw before, if we are only allowed to look at the next token and then we, we need to see if a particular rule is valid, it will be very interesting to know all the possible tokens that rule can start with, right? Because if we have that token and the token is in one of these particular non-terminals that are allowed, then we know that we are good because 
because it's possible that that rule has that start with that token. But if we have a particular token and then we are trying to parse a rule and that rule doesn't start with that token, we know that it's invalid. So we can say that it's a syntax error, right? So this is what is called the first set. And it's going to be very important later. Uh, so this is the first set of some of the expressions. So for example, print can only start with print, race can only start with race, but simple statement can start with all of these things. Okay, so let's see how the parser works. So CPython actually doesn't have a handwritten parser, it has a parser generator. So it's a tool that generates the parser for us from the grammar file, which makes it much, much more uh, less error prone because you don't need to manually modify the parser every time um, you generate more grammar rules. So let's see how it works. So the, it's, it's actually a very simple thing. So we start with the grammar in um, extended backwards not form, which is the document that we saw before. And this, this will product, this will produce um, non-deterministic finite automata. So l l we'll see what this is. B basically, these things are just um, control graph flow. So it's like this kind of drawing when you have nodes and arrows telling you which option you have. We'll see some examples. And the thing is that these, these initial things are very simple to produce, but they are very complicated. It's full of errors and complexity. So the, the step that grabs one of these and converts them in what is called a deterministic finite automata is basically simplifying it and making it more, more easy to, um, to follow. Uh, so let's see one example. So let's, uh, let's say we start with this rule, which is the rule for factors, right? Like A plus B, A minus B, not something, right? So this is, this is the rule. So then the first thing that the, par the parser generator produces is the non-deterministic finite automata, which is this control graph, right? So we will start in this state, and then we will go down until we start seeing these this, uh, tokens. So the idea is that you start here, and then you read some particular program that is trying to follow that rule, and if you are able to go from the state to the end, then the rule is correct. If you are not able to go to, from the start to the end, then the rule is invalid. So imagine that instead of plus, minus, and tilde, you have um, asterisk, right, which is not part of this rule in particular. Uh, so this then you cannot follow here because there is no step that has the asterisk. It's actually hidden in power, so it's a valid Python program, but if you don't look at power for now, you can imagine how you cannot follow this thing now. So this is very complicated because in theory, you can only follow the arrows if one of the tokens is allowed. So for example, for a state four to a state eight, it's very easy to know if you can follow because if you find the minus sign, then you can go ahead. But you, if you don't find the minus sign, then you cannot follow it. And the problem is that we have here in the non-deterministic automata, we have some stages which we don't know if we can like follow them or not. For example, for going from state zero to state one or two, we don't have any particular sign to follow. So that, that is a problem because we don't know if we can, where are, are the rules to transition to that stage or not. That's the complicated part of the non-deterministic finite automata. So the next step is to produce a deterministic one, which is that one. So in this case, as you can see, all the states, the, all the transition between a state and something is followed by a particular token. So for example, if one in a state is zero, we just need to look at the next like, token in the input, either plus, minus, or tilde. And if it's not any of these, we, we say that the rule is invalid. If it's one of these, then we follow it and we fo go to state one. And state one goes to another rule called factor. But as you can see in this particular uh, DFA, sorry, uh, yeah, DFA, there is not transition between the state and states with an unknown transition. But you can see something which is still bad, which is, for example, this node, which is here isolated. This node is rubbish. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that when we pr transform this thing into this thing, we produce some things which are either extremely complicated or they, can, they are basically rubbish, which has no states. So the next step is simplifying the thing into what is called the final DFA. So basically, it's removing complexity and removing this, this particular node. So this is basically what it is. It's produced this kind of control flow diagrams, which are still very complicated. With some particular algorithm, you transform this to this, which is very not and old. And from this, you run uh, some simplification, which is called a minimization algorithm, and then you produce those here. And this, this particular diagrams is what the parser follows. If you think about this, it's more or less like a hash table or a dictionary. So basically, you are in a particular state, and then you look at the, the possible keys. Here are plus, minus, or tilde. And if you have them in the dictionary or the hash table, then you transition to whatever value you have. And if you don't, you say that the rule is invalid. So that makes actually the parser so much, so, so fast, because it's basically some sort of hash table lookup again and again and again, nesting these, these rules here. So for example, when you go to power, like the, the square box in power, you have another of these basically describing what that particular sub rule is. So it's basically nested diagrams instead of nested diagrams. So let's see some examples here. Um, so for example, we can see uh, the rule for comparison. So in this example, you always will have the 
the complicated one, right, the non-DFA on the left, then the DFA here and the simplified ones here. So you more or less can, can see what kind, even if you know exactly the algorithm, uh, which is not super complicated, but it will take a lot of time to, exp to explain, uh, you can see more or less, or you can feel the kind of simplification that the parser starts doing. So this is, for example, for comparing things uh, between them. Um, this is the rule for um, like the comparison, but with the actual token. So you will see things that you recognize as comparison operator, like not equals, less than, uh, bigger than. So you can see actually how, when the rule is actually a bit more complicated, the non-DFA is actually a monster, and this non-DFA is actually very well simplified. I didn't put the, the one in the middle because it's still, it doesn't fit in, in the particular screen. Um, so we can see more. Uh, so for example, this is the decorator. Uh, and this is a very interesting example because you can see actually from um, a very high point of view what you can decorate. So for example, in the rule for decorator things, you can see that you can decorate async functions, class definitions, and functions. And you cannot decorate anything more because uh, the rule doesn't allow that. At the end, we will see a way of adding things to this so you can play a bit later. But you can see how these things are actually, even if you don't see the rules and only you see this kind of automatas with some, something lower level, you can still recognize more or less what is valid or what is describing. Um, so more of these, you have the, um, the, the factor and turn that we saw before. So you can see how here in the non-DFA, we have still this, this transition between states and in the like um, end one, we have only transition between the, the typical numbers. And you can see how they, they actually um, much more simplify. So I want to show you my favorite one, which is this one. So this one is the, f the diagram that parses um, function definitions, which is this monster. <laughs> but don't worry, because this is the non-DFA, right? So let's see the simplified version, which is much clearer to read. <laughs> This is not. So this is the most complicated rule. But this is a reason it's so complicated. And this is one of the things we are going to see at the end. So the reason it's so complicated is because the way we need to describe this rule is actually fighting the LL1 limitation. So the, the LL1, a, a lot of people see it as a bless because they say, OK, because it's a so simple grammar that has these, these very strong conditions that make them uh, like very strict, then it's very difficult to have like very complicated rules, which is good, because at the end, you want Python to be simple and readable and like not like other languages, <coughs> C++. So, uh, um, but there is a problem, which is that sometimes what the user perceives as a very simple rule is actually not that simple, or at least you cannot describe it as an L1 rule. And in that particular case, you need to do a hack, and you will see many hacks in the grammar, which is called full left expansion, which is literally grabbing all the tree and expand it at the end, because you cannot have like these limitations will arise in a way, but there is a, there is a, a way of solving this limitation, which is having a rule full of non-terminals. And in that way, you don't have this problem because um, you don't need to deal with first set because it's all non-terminals. And the reason this particular rule is so complicated is because it's one of them. And this is the most complex example of the most best example. Um, okay, so let's let's continue. So let's see what limitations on the LL, LL1 grammar are. Um, so one particular example, for example, let's see, let's see uh, this rule. So this rule we have is whatever rule, and it will start with the word do, then some particular um, subrule called a, then while an expression. And then we have another possibility for the rule, which is the same, start, except that it has another rule called b. And then we go to the first sets, we remember are the non-terminals a rule can start with, and we see that a can start with the letter a or the letter b, and b can start with the letter a or the letter c, right? Then Let's say we are trying to parse this input, right? The user writes that, and we want to see if it's a, it's a correct program. In this case, we know that it's the first choice, like, like the first rule, because if we go to the first set, this B can only be on the first set of a, capital A. So we know it's this particular here, right? Because this A can only st can start with A, uh, sorry, with B, and we have B. So the option B doesn't have B inside, so we know it's not B. But let's say the user writes that code. So now we have a problem because this particular lowercase a appears in both. So is this one or is this one? So we don't know. And this makes the rule ambiguous because we, you don't know which one of the two, right? Because if you go with all the tokens that the rule can start, they share one of the non-terminals. So when you find this a, you don't know which rule to choice. And this is a problem because this rule is invalid in another one. And this is the limitation, right? This is what makes ambiguous. You could, if you have a more powerful parser, and then you say, OK, but imagine that I'm able to like follow and read more tokens on do backtracking, then you can distinguish this one or this one. But because we are only allowed to look at the next token, we, we cannot, right? So when we are passing do, 
and then we look at the next token, we find A, and then we, know, we don't know what to follow, and that's the problem. So this happens in CPython, so actually it happens a lot. So for example, this is the rule that describes how to pass, um, how to call functions. And particularly, I want you to look at this argument rule. So let's, let's see what the argument is. Okay, so we have um, test is basically an object, so three, four, x, whatever. Then we have the keyword arguments, so a particular name equal and an object, and then we have star star like dictionary unpacking and, and uh, list unpacking, right? So this rule is actually not, not valid, because if we look at the first sets of test, so this one, it actually contains name. So these two are ambiguous, because if you are here and then you say, okay, I, will, I want to choose this one or this one, and then you find name. You don't know if to choose this one, because test also starts with name. So you don't know which one to follow. So this makes these rules not possible, but you can still call functions in Python, right? So how is made? So this is one of the first hacks we have, which is that the actual rule is test equal test. And this rule allows to do things like um, list comprehension equal to list comprehension, or dictionary comprehension equal to dictionary comprehension. And then you say, wait, 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 but I cannot write that thing in Python, right? So the reason is that we allow that thing on the parser, like the parser is pretty happy with that. But when it comes to the AST, which is much later in the, in the compiled pipeline, we say, by the way, is this test actually anything other than just a name, like a keyword? If it's not, then say syntax error. It's just that that syntax error doesn't happen on the parser, but you don't know. So little lies that we have. Uh, another interesting one is the, do you know the walrus operator? So the walrus operator also suffered this. So this is the rule for the walrus operator, which is like a particular name, uh, the walrus operator, and an object. And this has the same problem, right? Because the first set of tests also include name. And you say, hey, but I don't see the pipe, right? So it's not this or, or this thing. But you think about it the same case, because, because this is optional, right? So if you are saying, okay, I need to pass the thing, or I actually have this optional part. So because you can only look one token, and both can start with the word name, like the non-terminal name, which is any Python variable, then you don't know what to choose. So again, you have the same problem, and the actual rule again is this horrible thing, and then we force it much later. As you can imagine, this is not very, um, like, maintainable. And then we have one that Lucas here knows very well. So this is um, with statements, right? And this is valid Python 3. So in Python 3, you can have multiple um, context managers in the same width expression. So you, for example, you can say with A as X, B as Y. And then if you have a lot of these, then you say, well, I don't want to put all of them in the same line. So if you want to continue, you, use, use, you need to use this uh, line break character, right? Which is sort of okay, except that this thing really mess with indentation. And auto formatter tools like black cannot really format this thing very well. So you could do this thing if you allow this thing, which is put parentheses around, right? So you say something like, okay, so we open parentheses and then you put all your context managers and then you close parentheses. This, this particular construct is very easy for auto formatters because they know what is delimited here, right? Um, except that this is invalid. And you would say, why? It sounds like, I mean, I have seen this thing before, right? I've seen this thing in strings, I see this thing in imports, right? You can say import and then open parentheses and a bunch of things. Well, it turns out that if you analyze the rule, which is this one, and then you want to allow the parentheses, to, then you say, okay, so I'm going to write the same rule, so with, and then I'm going to put two possibilities, right? The old rule, and then I'm going to say open parentheses, the old rule, and close parentheses, right? So it's either the rule or the rule in between parentheses. So again, the problem of this is that this is ambiguous because this guy, which is the item, also can start with the open parentheses. So you say with open parentheses, now you don't know if the parentheses belongs to because you write three between parentheses or because you are grouping with parentheses the whole rule, right? Um, and this is sad, so we cannot implement that. I really try. Um, okay, so you will see, right? So we have this dual thing in how we describe the grammar. We have a very powerful and simple way to describe it because we have an L1 restriction, and this makes not only the parser very fast, but also very simple to describe. But then we have all these weird things because we, we want to put some rules that we know they are simple enough for users to use, but all these technical restrictions restrict what you can do. And I want you to pause here and make you think about this because 
The fact that the, rule, the grammar is L1 and all these things, is they're actually very technical implementation details, right? Like, this is something that the user doesn't need to know. But this thing, which is at the core, like, really, really deep down, this thing right now is percolating outside, right? Like, even if you are not, a, like, writing C Python, and you're writing your own interpreter, and then you want to fulfill Python grammar, even if you have the most powerful parser, right now, if you want to run valid Python, you cannot write this. Which is weird, right? It's like the, the implementation detail are poisoning something as important as the grammar. And, and this is like sort of dangerous and uh, like worrying and beautiful at the same time how these tiny technical decisions can, can affect so much. Like what is a Python, valid Python program? Um, so at the end, just to conclude this particular uh, step, so what the parser produces what is called a parse tree. So if you write x plus y, following all these DFAs and basically the algorithms that we saw, it produces this particular structure, and if you substitute those numbers to the actual rules, you will have this, right? So that three plus four or one plus 14 or something is, is this, this particular work, which is basically a flattened out version of the diagram that we saw before. So this is what is fed to the AST, and we are going to stop here because we are not going to talk about ASTs. So this is when the parser ends. Um, so uh, what I'm going to show you right now as a application is how, imagine that you want to create a new grammar rule in C Python, or in Python, right? Like, I want to extend Python for playing a bit, so, or, or how we core developers actually uh, write new grammar rules. So let's say you want to write this rule, right? So you have two objects, and then you want to implement the arrow operator, which is something that the user can implement, right? So the user, imagine that the user has a class, and the class implements underscore, underscore, arrow, underscore, underscore, and, you, and that's, that's something, right? And then you want to allow to write A, arrow, B, and it calls this particular function, right? In the same way, when you write A plus B, it calls dunder add. So the first you need to do is add this token to the tokenizer, so, sorry, to the grammar. So you go to the grammar, then you find the rule describing multiplication, division, and all the stuff, and then you add the arrow here, right? So we have the star, the slash, all the things that are allowed, and then we say also the arrow. So when you add this thing, and then you write the parser generator, um, you need to include the token as a valid token, right? So it, you go to this particular file, which is in C, so we are going to see a lot of C code. Uh, and then you say, okay, there is a new token, which is going to be called arrow, and we are not explaining which token is at this point, so we're just defining the existence of the token. So the idea is to give you a, ooh, is the end? Okay, so I'm going to go fast. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, very fast. Okay. So then you go to the tokenizer and r describe how to pass the thing. So you find a, like a minus sign and then followed by the bigger sign. Then you say, okay, that's the arrow. And you say, return the arrow. Then if you run the tokenizer, you will see that the tokenizer already is able to pass the arrow. So it's actually very simple to do, even if you don't understand how I'm doing these things. Um, so these three lines here is the only thing you need to do for the AST to pass. So you don't need to understand it. You just need to say that if you know what you're doing, it's actually very simple. <laughs> Um, and then finally, you, the only thing you need to do is implement the actual operator. So in this case, this is the bytecode for that, which means like you find A, arrow B, then pop A, pop B, call the function uh, describing the arrow, and then continue with the interpreter, which is again very simple if you know what you're doing. And finally, you just need to describe that there is something called arrow and write arrow, which can be described in the objects, which is again these three lines plus the header file. And with that, you can write this code. So you can create a class that implements underscore, underscore, arrow, and in this case, I'm going to map the operator to the other, and then you can write this code, f, like, arrow, v, and it basically maps the function over the list. So as you see, all of these particular, and I'm ending right now. So if you see, all of these particular, like, things make implementing new rules, as the one that we saw right now, extremely simple, but they carry out all this danger and all this impact on, um, on the language that you see and appreciate. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for surpassing the hour. Thank you.